I'm Philip Ward, Editor-in-Chief of AntMiniEurope.com. I'm at ECR 2019, and this week, gadolinium safety, the safety of gadolinium-based contrast agents for MRI, is a major issue. I'm very pleased to have with me today uh, Dr. Alexander Radbrook from Germany. Alexander, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Philip, for the kind invitation. It's an honor to be here again. Excellent. Now, a year ago, Alex, at ECR 2018, we were discussing safety of gadolinium. Um, it was, in fact, our most popular video last time, our most popular interview. Um, I was wondering if we could start by having a roundup of the significant events. What have been the, the major breakthroughs in, in gadolinium retention of the brain, the research that's being done? Yeah. I think the most important thing uh, that we need to point out Philip, during the last year is that from a clinical point of view and from a histopathological point of view, basically no new information are, informations are available right now. So it's important that everything that we need about gadolinium deposition so far is uh, that in the animal experiments uh, no clinical correlates and no correlates in histopathological uh, stains have been shown. So, first of all, that is the most important information. Uh, the second thing where research focuses on is the way actually gadolinium enters the brain. And there we found out what is interesting and what might be of diagnostic value is that gadolinium enters the CSF. And that is something we overlooked in the, in the recent years. So, that holds true for all gadolinium injections, that a very small part of the gadolinium enters the CSF and then is excreted over f for the glymphatic pathway. I think that's another uh, very interesting fact that we learned more about last year. But I really want to point out that does not necessarily need to be a bad thing. This is something we might need for diagnostic purposes, like okay. for example for uh, imaging of dementia. So this is something we have to explore in the next years. Okay, so Alex, the, uh, you're suggesting then that there's a lot of work still to be done, there's a lot of research still to be done. Are we many years off, off do you think, from conclusive evidence of, of gadolinium retention of the brain? Yeah, that remains a very difficult question. I know last year we said that we might be 10 years away from it. I think, of course, our, our duty is to do everything that is possible for patient safety. My personal opinion there is that we might get some evidence from the animal studies and there I think another important fact is right now we are focusing on the brain but we need to keep in mind that the vast majority of uh, gadolinium is not retained in the brain but in other organs such as the skin. So I think we might get more knowledge from animal studies uh, from different parts than the brain but again very important to point out no clinical correlates have been proven so far, and also on histopathology, no, uh, no really uh, correlates have been shown there for gadolinium deposition. Okay. Now, do you have any new advice for general radiologists about how they're using contrast agents? That is very important for all general radiologists, is that we treat gadolinium like every other medication. Prior to giving any medication to a patient, we need to perform a risk-benefit assessment. That is exactly the same for gallium-based contrast agents. So um, we also we have to weigh the risk on the one side that there might be a retention with unknown risk, and on the other side we've got the risk of missing a diagnosis. And that is very important uh, because this might be very often the by far larger risk to miss the diagnosis. So the advice for for um, radiologists all over the world would be like give gallium contrast agents whenever you think that it's really necessary for doing the correct diagnosis if it's not necessary just skip it okay now you're also a qualified lawyer um, have there been any developments in Europe on the legal cases um, are any companies any radiologists being sued by patients at the moment so in, at least in Europe I'm not aware of any legal cases there and I also think for the, for the general radiologist, I really think it sh just should not play a role. Just treat the patients in the best way you can and uh, make the right judgment, like uh, treat them like if they were your children or if they were your own family. I think then we should really not worry about any legal cases. Okay. The other aspect of this is the, the regulatory authorities. Um, have there been any developments or there, are there any, anything expected from the European Medicines Agency and the FDA? 
Yeah, we talked about that last year. There are the differences between the uh, FDA and the uh, European Medicines Agency. The European Medicines Agency actually decided to uh, withdraw all the linear gadolinium-based contrast agents from the market. For example, in Japan, we've got a situation where the authorities said that the macrocyclic compounds need to be the first choice and only in those very rare cases where there are allergic reactions against the macrocyclics, linear gadolinium-based contrast agents uh, can be used. In America, the FDA still leaves it up to the referring to this, um, physician to decide if they are using either linears or macrocyclics. Uh, to be very honest, I don't think that this situation will change unless there are dramatic scientific developments that show that there are any correlates, which I don't expect. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because markets will decide this themselves. Because I think, for example, if you have a look at the contrast agent that is applied to children in the United States, there is a clear shift from linear to macrocyclics in recent years. So today it's nearly 100% macrocyclics in the Ameri also in the American mar markets. So I think at the end of the day, it really doesn't make a difference. I think the markets will decide this themselves. Okay. Now, one of your presentations this week is about artificial intelligence and how that may, in the future, replace gadolinium. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, artificial intelligence currently is a hype on every conference. Um, but I think also in terms of gadolinium deposition, there are very interesting approaches that we need to pursue. So one idea would be to replace the gadolinium injections by so-called virtual contrast gadolinium. How does that work? So we obtain all the information from the uh, scans that we have prior to gadolinium injections like T1, uh, diffusion, uh, T2, flare, SWI. And we get all this information together and by analyzing with artificial intelligence um, we get a prediction of where the gadolinium might be and that could replace the gadolinium injection. So the truth is I think that is a fascinating idea and we have to pursue this way. Currently it's not ready for clinical application and uh, we, have to be, uh, we have to pursue these ideas. I think that's our obligation as scientists but currently it's not ready for a clinical application. Okay, excellent. Alex, thank you very much for your, for your roundup. Very nice to speak with you. And um, I hope the Congress goes well for you this week. I hope it's successful. Philip Ward, Aunt Mini Europe, wrapping up.